has his first ever re- uh, regional, thanks to uh, older age and a bad back uh, by Mr. Lundquist, but boy, well deserved. He is the voice of the Brooklyn Nets, which is, uh, you know, you don't want to say that too loudly, but that's what he is. And we haven't had a chance to talk to him in a long time. He's our good buddy, Ian Eagle. Ian, how are you today, pal? Okay. Doggy, what an intro. Thank you so much. I feel so welcome. <laughs> how how's it, how's it feel to do your first regional in the NCAA tournament? Oh, glorious. Completely glorious. Although I have done it the last 10 years on radio. So in terms of the preparation and the routine and the regimen, I've been doing it for a while. I'm just going to have a camera on and I'll talk a little bit less. Yeah, but, I mean, this is a big deal, though, Ian. I mean, now with the split coverage with TNT, you know, it's harder to get um, a regional on this uh, NCAA. You know that deal with the football, with that wild card, with the playoff game. One year you get it, next year you don't. It's a big step for you. I mean, you've had a hell of a career as it is. You're the number two guy now at CBS, and you get a regional on television. I know radio, but television for the first time in 15. How many years have you done in tournament? About 18, 19 years? Do you know radio? You are familiar with radio. Yes, 21 years. 21 years? Old. 20, oh, my God. 1998, Jim Spinarkle and I were sent out to Sacramento, and I remember getting the call at 9 o'clock on Sunday night of the regional, uh, of the uh, first round, and they tell me, you're going to Sacramento, and I quickly look up the teams, and the first team that I started to research was Maryland, and Maryland had a player, you might remember him, it was Sharunas Yesakabachis. <laughs> the, the first name that I see, and I'm like, oh, my goodness, I can't believe it. I get the NCAA tournament. I'm going to butcher this name throughout the tournament. And I convinced myself that I could do it by breaking it down a la Marv Albert. And I would approach it, yes, a cabbages. And every time I saw him get the ball, I would continue to remind myself so I would not screw up the name. So 21 years of the NCAA tournament, believe but- it or not. Gallagher, and obviously the two games last weekend. Do you prefer doing the on the opening weekend? Do you prefer doing Thursday or Friday? Well, I did the first four as well. So oh, that's right, you did. Layer. You did a day. You yeah. Did. So I ended up doing Wednesday, Friday. I know you like the travel bit. We flew into Dayton Tuesday morning. We attended the four practices. Spinarco and I had dinner. We turned around. We did the two games on Wednesday night. And Allie LaForce joined us. We got in a car at 7.30 Wednesday morning, drove three hours, 15 minutes to Detroit. The first practice was 11 a.m. We walked in the arena at 10.52. Wow, how about that? Yeah, I did not see the. I was at Bruce that night, so I, you, I did not do this. I did not see that second day of the, fun, of the first four. How is that Detroit arena, by the way? Really nice. Top top notch, already a, a top five arena. They, they have not been drawing for the Pistons or for the Red Wings. They did get a huge crowd for Michigan State. But you know how it is for the NCAA tournament. When you open up that first day, whether it's Thursday or Friday, the opening game does not have a big game feel. That's usually a 12-20, 12-40 tip, and they don't necessarily schedule the team that's going to draw the largest crowd at 12 in the afternoon. So it builds over the course of that first session. And then the second session, the first game was Michigan State. So it was packed. It was every seat filled. And then after that game, they basically, uh, I'd say half the arena left. And you had Syracuse and TCU playing in front of about 10,000 fans. But but I've seen the arena. I've not been in it. I was there last year when they were finishing it. The arena is a good arena. Yeah, really nice arena, good sight lines. It's it's a stadium, though. It's not intimate by any stretch. It reminds me of United Center, Staples Center. It's multi-level. You look up, there are going to be luxury boxes all the way at the top. In addition to the second level, they have multi-level luxury boxes to create that stadium feel. It's, It's a serious venue, and... They did a good job. They uh, they, they certainly uh, were prepared, and they were a good host for, for the first two weekends of the tournament. Uh, you're, you're still a young guy. Is Even for you, does it get tiring to do four games in one day? Yeah, it does. It does. And it wasn't bad this year. For whatever reason, I didn't feel it. It's really more the mental part. You, you just start questioning yourself at some point. Do I have the right guy? Do I have the right team? 
Uh, you begin to go through the the mental gymnastics of the eight teams that you're prepared for. So you toss in the first four. That was a three team addition because the team that we had Syracuse advanced to Detroit. So I ended up preparing for 11 teams and you just want to make sure you get rid of the information when you're done with it so that it's not retained for the next game and you start spewing out uh, minutia and stats that don't pertain to the game that you're covering. But it is, it is tiring. It's fun. It's challenging, but it, it definitely wears you out. Did you see, you didn't see them play in a regular season like TCU and maybe even Arizona State. Do you watch as the play-by-play guy? I know Spinarco does. Does the play-by-play guy have to watch a game regular season to get a sense of what was going on? Or you go into those do. games? Or you go to those get going to those games cold? No, you can't go in blind. You have to watch at least one game of each team. And even if it's fast forward, if it's shuttling through, you have to put names to numbers. You have to find some physical attributes that you can latch on to. If a player is a lefty, you want to write that on your chart. And that actually becomes something that stands out for the play-by-play guy. You're looking for anything that can jar your memory in the moment. So you can identify, you can get it correct. But, no, you can't go in blind. You, you have to watch at least some of every team before you show up at the site. All right, you do the Friday game. Do you watch the Thursday first round or do you blow it off? Yeah, I watch them. I put them on in the background. I'm, I'm doing work. But it could be a team that pops up as you continue. So, as an example, I ended up watching a lot of Texas Tech and Florida just because it was a competitive game. And then I look up and I've got Texas Tech in my region this week. So it's beneficial, and it's also good to get a a sense and a feel for the tournament. You don't want to be completely locked in. You're so immersed in your eight teams, but you have to know that it's a global point of view, and the fact of the matter is you have to be at least open to what's happening around the rest of the tournament so that you could speak from an educated position and and that you're not just living in your own little bubble. Now, when you do the NFL, the coaches know you after a long year. These sure. other coaches in college, when you do your little 10-minute deal with them before the games, you know, I don't know if Matt Painter, if you've done a Purdue game, I'm not sure how much he knows you, or the Butler coach for that matter. Are these coaches, are they comfortable with the CBS broadcast crew when they get their 10 minutes to do a little preview before the game privately or not? Yeah, 99% get it. And every now and again, you have a coach that might slip through the cracks and doesn't care, doesn't need it, doesn't require it. doesn't mean he doesn't meet with you but he may not be open. Uh, Matt Painter, I have had a number of Purdue games through the years. Uh, here with Jay Wright, maybe the best ever. He oh, is Wright's tremendous great. to deal with. The best. Yeah. He's a great guy, great person, great coach, great communicator, you name it. I had never met Chris Beard before, so Texas Tech, I was the first meeting today. Interesting guy with a really intriguing story. He was a basketball head coaching vagabond, Division three, Division two, minor league basketball in South Carolina. He was an assistant to Bobby Knight and Pat Knight. So he's had an odyssey to get to this point, and he's got a really good team. And then Bob Huggins, who I've had a number of times in the NCAA tournament, you know, he's got that rough exterior, but Jim Spinarkle and, and Bob played against one another when Jim was at Duke and Bob was at West Virginia. So they have this connection going back to their playing days. It was 1977. And every time that I've sat down with Bob, he's he's been nothing but – great to deal with and, and yeah. brutally honest. He's honest about his team as much as he is about the opponent. So we're pretty fortunate. All four guys were, were very good to deal with. Yeah, he's a little gruff. If he doesn't know you, that's a tricky yep. spot. So, uh, I can see that. Uh, do the, um, are the coaches, do they know that Spinarco was a great player at Duke? Yeah, I would say every guy. I don't think we've ever come across a coach. I've done now 18 tournaments with Jim. Yeah, Jim is synonymous with that run in 78, the loss to Kentucky in the championship game. So just think about the numbers right now. That's 40 years ago. Well, that's, that's what I mean. A lot, of these, a lot of these, you know, Chris Beard may not know that he played at Duke in the late 70s. That's the question. Yeah, I think he knows. Uh, at, at least as of this moment that I look back on all the coaches that we've met with, I don't feel like we've ever met with a guy that, that looked at Jim and said, right, well, what's this guy's background? Uh, Jim, first of all, the name 
stands out. It's hard to forget that name. And secondly, he's been doing this for so long now. So there are those that may not know the resume, but they know him as a broadcaster, and they put two and two together. What's the biggest thing that you see difference-wise uh, from a intensity standpoint, an NCAA tournament game and an NBA playoff game, The a couple of you've had a chance to do with the NBA Brooklyn Nets. What's the uh, what's the biggest difference? What's the, What are the similarities intensity-wise between a one-and-done deal in the NCAA and a big NBA playoff game that you have done? Yeah, I mean, just skill level more than anything else. That's the one thing that's always stood out for me. I've done the NBA now 24 years, and things, even as a play-by-play announcer, that you've just come to expect. If there's a two-on-one break in the NBA, nine times out of ten, they're going to convert or they're going to get to the free-throw line. There's a two-on-one break in college basketball. Even the best NCAA tournament teams, that's not a guarantee. That could be a five or six out of ten deal. So I think you're a little bit more hesitant on the play-by-play side to commit necessarily to a call. Villanova, strangely enough, would be the closest thing that that I can recall to an NBA style for rhythm purposes, where they make the extra pass, where they make open threes, uh, where they move the ball around, where they make uh, that, that winning play. That stood out to me when I did their game earlier this year against UConn and then watching them on tape. Uh, Their style is similar to uh, the rhythm and the cadence that you would normally see for an NBA game. But West Virginia is going to look to to completely disrupt that. That's what they do. That's what Bob Huggins has always done. Did it at Cincinnati. He's brought it up a level at West Virginia. And if he can get Villanova to buy into their style and their defensive approach, uh, they could change the way that that Villanova – uh, performs in this game. Now, yep. if you break the press, Chris, you can make open threes. You'll get open looks from three-point range. And Villanova's been about as good as anybody at making open threes, but you still have to get through that initial wave, and Huggins will send 9, 10, 11 players deep on his roster to make sure that you don't know what's coming. They come at you in waves. But the real good team usually does that. That's why I don't like Correct. West Virginia in this spot. Do you look forward – now, you've had a long year with the Nets. I know they're fun. They can they, they play a lot of close games. I think the coach is probably the nicest guy that you've ever dealt with in the NBA, Atkinson. He gets it. Uh, so, But still, uh, that's a long year, a lot of rough commuting to that arena. You probably look forward to getting away from NBA play-by-play for a couple of weeks, correct? Well, I've, I've become so used to it because I've been doing it so long. So uh, I circle the dates in my calendar, and I know every year I've got to shift my attention and really have laser focus and concentration to do this event at a high level. So it's nothing new for me from the net side of things. There have been years where they've been in a playoff chase, and you feel badly that you're not a part of it for two weeks, and then you pop back in, and there are important NBA games. And obviously there have been years where you come back in and – They're just playing out the string. This year, yeah, it's a more pleasing style. They've played more competitive games this year than they did a year ago. So from a broadcasting standpoint, as as long as it's competitive, I can find some meat on the bone, and I'll be enthusiastic, and I'll commit fully like I do for every NBA game. But in terms of the intensity level, uh, it's it's not quite the same of, of what I'm going to see over this two-week right. period. Uh, these guys are getting after it because for the majority of them, Chris, this is it. This is the highest they're ever going to play of organized basketball. And then from here on out, they're going to have to look back and, and hit their DVR to remember the day they played in the NCAA tournament. If Steve's sitting there, we can say goodnight because Ian's done a tremendous job. Do you find out that the um, NBA player, does he follow the tournament? Carefully, does the NBA, does does each NBA team have a guy who kind of organizes the brackets and things like that? Or has the NBA player, you know, been there, done that, and so immersed in his own team he could care less? What's going on with that? Yeah, I can tell you that the other night when Virginia was getting upset, the Nets were on their team bus, and everybody was watching the UMBC game on their phones, and really? they were crushing Joe Harris. Crushing him. Oh, uh, Harris went to Virginia? They knew. Okay, yeah, nice. he's a Virginia guy. He's a proud Virginia guy. I think Joe was definitely talking a big game that this year Virginia could win a national championship. And it shows you that it still plays a role. These guys pay attention. You know, clearly, if you have an affiliation with a school, Harris LeVert's a Michigan guy. So uh, Nick Stauskas as well for the Nets. They've 
they've obviously been been talking a lot of stuff over the last couple of weeks. But I, I just think there's still a fun quality to it because for most of these players, that was a pretty special time. You know, when you still didn't really quite know how all of this worked and not to say you were playing just for the love of the game. You, you saw it as a conduit. You saw it as a bridge to a professional career. But I do think it was a little bit simpler for these guys, so they have fond memories of their experiences. Yeah. Uh, does the um, uh, Diane Eagle, of course, he's got the games to, uh, Friday in Boston, so he gives us a couple minutes here. He's got the first game is uh, Texas Tech and Purdue and then Villanova and West Virginia. Uh, Actually, the other way, Chris. Oh, it's the other way? Villanova's the first. No, yeah, boy, Villanova's Villanova, they put leading off. Why did they do that? That's a surprise. Why did they do that? I, I don't know. Not not sure. I I don't know. I didn't obviously get any kind of explanation on that, but we got the word that, that is Villanova, West Virginia open up and Texas Tech Purdue on the back end of it. I think both you... games could be very competitive. Maybe uh, with Philly being closer, they anticipate that they'll get a bigger crowd from Villanova early to get this thing going and then the carry over into the second game. Maybe. I don't know what the philosophy was. Maybe. Uh, you know, that you also might be doing an empty building there. That's, a, that's tough to sit there for two games. And it's not that easy. You might be getting an no. empty building by 11 o'clock at night. Does the NBA play? You know, the NBA goes in and out of the clouds, I, and right now it's in and out of the clouds. You know, you're not really thinking NBA too much right now. It's a very tough time of the year to play NBA basketball. Is anybody who's paying attention to basketball is thinking about the NCAA, not the NBA. Is that noticeable when you do an NBA game this time of the year? No, I haven't noticed it. It hasn't been anything tangible from from my perspective. I think people that are NBA people are, are completely locked in and, and still looking at the standings. I think Houston is getting a lot of attention right now, and rightfully so, for the season that Harden has had and just the ease in which this team can score and the question which you've asked i'm sure and we'll all ask will it translate into the playoffs can they play a good enough level of defense to be a legitimate team to come out of the western conference or is it pretty regular season basketball and when it's time to lock down an opponent are they capable of doing although i do think they're better defensively than they've been in previous years and capella has turned into a really good player and a really good fit for d'antoni's system I think it'll get ramped up again. The one thing the NBA has figured out, and I'm not even sure it was a conscious decision on their part, they've really nailed the soap opera stories of sports, that you've got players that that pair off against one another on social media. The fact that you can see these guys, maybe you feel there's a deeper connection. They're not under helmets. They're not under hats. Uh, You can see them, and they're very visible. And I think the way the popularity has gone for this league, it's building. To me, uh, they're actually riding a crescendo right now. It might not be in this moment. You're right with the NCAA tournament. It takes a little of the sizzle out. But once you turn the corner and get ready for the playoffs and some of the matchups that we might see and the fact that uh, LeBron dominates the headlines and the Raptors are a curious story now, I think they, they're going to have some juice going into the, the postseason. I think the NBA is in good shape. Uh, I, I agree with that to a certain degree, but I think the biggest problem the NBA has, Ian, is that there's an inevitability to it. There's never an upset in the first round. They should not be playing best of seven. It should be best of five. I know that the Western Conference has got good teams down below, so maybe they can scare somebody. But right. let's face it. We're, we're, you and I both know this. In the NCAA, there's a number of teams that can win. In the NBA right now, if I told you more than three teams can win a championship, Houston, Golden State, and Cleveland, you'd say, you know what, Chris, you're probably right. And I think in for, for the serious sports fan, the old fart like myself, who's been doing this for a long time, that, that's the problem that I have with the NBA sometimes is, you know, I'll watch every second of Houston Golden State. I mean, when Cleveland gets a little more advanced, I, I, I'll definitely watch them too. But I'm not sure if I'm going to sit there and watch Raptors, Bucks. No, I'll watch it. You know me. But I'm not sure. Uh, there's an inevitability to the fact that Toronto will beat Milwaukee, be a six-game series, and we'll go to the second round. I think that ho- I think that hurts the NBA with the predictability of their first round and second round deals. How about that for a second? Yeah, it's fair. It's a stars league, as we know, and the stars will dominate. I, I do think the Eastern Conference has surprised some people, a team like Indiana that you just assumed was going through a rebuilding process, and you realize Victor Oladipo might be better than we thought he was after two or three years in the league. That's a player that you might latch on to in the postseason if he starts putting up huge numbers and 
creating some memorable moments. That's something the NBA has figured out through the years. You're right. There has been an inevitability because Golden State's has been so good. But maybe for the first time since this pairing of Curry and Thompson and Durant, they could be vulnerable just based on their injuries and based on the fact that Houston has played so well. Portland has been incredible this year. What a story they've put together in Portland. Now, whether or not that carries over into the postseason remains to be seen. But at least the NBA has created a little bit of sizzle. You know, I think similar, and and you and I have talked about this before with the NFL. The NFL has a knack every year of a team finishing last, finishing first the next year. It's 13 straight years where that's happened. That's incredible. And that means that they are including fans that have now formed some optimism when their season starts. Other than Cleveland, most teams have been a factor at some point over the last five or six years. And I do think that parity has helped them. Now, has it changed at the top of the food chain? It did this year with Philadelphia. But you don't say the inevitability as much in the NFL, even though New England has won so many championships. 100% 100% right. Do the college kid, is he available to guys like you in these tournaments, or do they kind of zip up the college kid you can't see him as all coaches? No, no, no. They're pretty open about it. Ali LaForce does a great job of, of trying to grab two or three of them when they wrap up their practices just to get a human aspect of it and to humanize the player. She's uh, outstanding and terrific at it, and they seem to respond to it. No, they're, they're very open to it. Look, Jay Wright, as an example, Today, the practice wrapped up, and we're standing on the sidelines. Jay huddles up his team, and we look up, and now they've formed a line, and they've now worked their way towards our area, and one by one, they look us in the eye, say their name, and shake our hand. And, you know, that's a head coach who gets it. That's teaching a life lesson of uh, being open and making yourself engaged in the moment. They didn't have to do that. He didn't have to do that. I think it's just a smart move on his part uh, to try to teach these these young people yeah. what it's all about in life. Uh, uh, is the NBA coach more intrigued of what the college coach goes through, or is the college coach more intrigued about what the NBA coach goes through? Yeah, I would say the college coach is much more intrigued by the NBA coach because the college coach is dealing with things outside of basketball that they would rather not deal with. And if anything, there have been college coaches through the years that know I work in the NBA and they'll start lobbing questions my way. Well, how does it work with this? Uh, Who's responsible for that? Uh, How much time do they have to spend on this? And I always find it interesting because I think they're, they're trying to figure it out and rationalize it in their mind. If they were ever given an opportunity, Jay Wright is an example. I think he had a couple of chances and elected not to pull the trigger. I think Jay would be an outstanding NBA. Oh, I agree. I think he would be. He too. knows how to connect with people. He knows how to lead men. He knows when to step back and allow them to do their thing. Jay just has a really good feel for that. But I think he loves Villanova, and he loves the college game, and he loves having an impact on young people. So I don't know if, if he's ever going to really do it. Uh, his situation is so perfect and tailor-made for him that he just might be one of those guys that's a lifer. And that's yeah, he's, in a, he's got it going. It'd be hard for him. You know, he gets the very good player. He doesn't necessarily get the Hall of Famer. He's got a great player there now, but he gets yep. the very good player. So he has figured out a way to stay away from the one and dones, but get yep. that next tier kid. And because of that, that enables them to keep the kid there a little longer. So he's got a little older team. And then he still gets the borderline NBA, the Josh Hartz, the kid he's got now, which makes it easier for him when he gets into a team or against a game, against a club that's got a lot of great players. He's got a couple of NBA guys that can match up. Makes it easier for him to have a chance to win a championship every year. It's a big advantage he's got. There's no question about it. And you know what? Also, Doggy, I just looked at their roster just doing my prep work. They have no seniors. None. So there's this feeling of experience because they have the pedigree, Brunson, Booth, Bridges, all were part of that championship team two years ago. They were not the core. They were a part of it. They helped get that championship. But those guys are juniors. And, look, I think Bridges, he's going to the pros. Yeah, I think so. Yeah, the other two Uh, weren't, though. The the other two weren't. Today, if he's an NBA player, I think he is in the Fred Van Vliet model of the guy's got a chip on his shoulder, uh, he probably is being told he's 
not quite quick enough. He's not quite athletic enough, and he's used it as fuel. He's been around the NBA his whole life because of his dad. Rick played nine years in the league. He's coached longer than that in the NBA, and I think he's one of those guys that will figure it out. You make a great case. I don't think he's a bona fide NBA star, future Hall of Famer, but Jay continues to get really good players who are really smart and understand the team concept. Yeah, Van Fleet's a perfect example. Folks, he's on Toronto. He's done a hell of a job, Van Fleet. So that, uh, I think he's on Toronto, is he not? I, I got that he right. is. Yeah, yeah, and he's played really well. He's a big cog now as a second-round pick who was probably overlooked. You look at him, Chris, if he walked into the studio right now, you'd say, really? That's him? That's Fred Van Fleet? He, he just doesn't fit the measurables of what you look for in an NBA player. We talk about wingspan and size and strength yet the guy has a knack. That's the comparison I would make to Jalen Brunson. Uh, Last thing on the Nets uh, and the arena and everything else. Uh, I think the arena is great. I think they play up the Brooklyn thing well. I just don't know long term here the fan base scenario, you know, the Knicks and everything else. What can you tell me about where Brooklyn is right now as a franchise? Uh, There's still a curiosity because the crowds have been good. Last night, it was snowing, as you know. It was terrible weather. But because they've got a major subway station inside their arena, I looked up for tip-off, and there were 13,000, 14,000 people there. Uh, It's hard to believe. I was shocked. I I thought it was going to be one of those nights where you could hear a pin drop. It wasn't the case. People showed up. People are still into it. Uh, the novelty has not worn off, but at some point you got to win. It's that simple. And that's just not true for Brooklyn. That's true anywhere. I, I don't care where you are in this country when you have limited disposable income and you have to figure out how you want to use that as a family. Uh, you want to go to a product that is entertaining, and ultimately you want to feel like you're a part of something. The Nets' upper management took over a very difficult situation. They knew that. Sean Marks was fully aware of it. The hope was that they could change the culture. The hope was they could find some keepers. And now they got to figure out which of this bunch will be here when the smoke clears. Is D'Angelo Russell the player that will be here uh, two years from now, three years from now? Is he going to be part of the solution? Karis LeVert, Rondé Hollis Jefferson, Jared Allen. uh, Are these players that will be a part of it when this thing gets turned around? Or is this just a group along the way in the process? Uh, That is yet to be determined. Wow. I ain't great job. Always a pleasure to talk. I'll leave you alone. Go do a couple of good ball games this weekend. <laughs> Doggy, you're the best. See you you're soon. Uh, our good buddy is Ian Eagle. Gives you everything you got there. You can't ask for a better spot. Half uh, Quarter to six. Uh, quarter to three in the West. We continue here on Mad Dog Unleashed. Don't go 